Thanks, Max. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Fiona Di Domenico, joined by Hans. I'm with Castle Group. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your, I think it's, it's Wednesday, I do believe, out of your Wednesday afternoon. Um, we've got a great topic today, but I want to take just a quick minute, tell you a little bit about Castle Group for those of you that uh, are not familiar. So uh, Castle is a Florida-based firm. We're all across the state of Florida, and uh, we specialize in doing condominium and homeowner association management. We work with lots of boards, uh, very much like I'm sure uh, ones that you are on now. So thank you for volunteering your time. And we're working all across the state. Uh, most of our associations are um, highly amenitized associations and associations where there is a, at least one team member on site. But many of our associations are larger scale, um, are highly amenitized. Uh, a lot of our associations even have full food and beverage. So uh, we're very well versed in, uh, in property and uh, management and would uh, welcome any questions that you may have. Um, after this webinar today, you can reach us at info at castlegroup.com. And I wanted to take a minute to uh, introduce uh, Hans. Hans is gonna tell you a little bit about himself. And Hans, thank you for uh, joining today and for volunteering your time to, uh, to help us out. Why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about you and your firm, and then um, we're looking forward to chatting with you for about the next hour or so. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Fiona. I appreciate that. And thank you to the Castle Group for having me today. I appreciate that as well. Uh, my name is Hans Wall. I'm a uh, attorney uh, certified by the Florida Bar. Um, I'm board certified in plan development and uh, condominium law, which is the, the Florida Bar's fancy way of saying community association law. So I've been uh, board certified in this area uh, since 2018. Uh, this is my main practice area. It's about 80% of what I do is representing community associations throughout the state. Um, you name it, I've done it. We'll, we're full service. My firm is Cava Gonzalez. Uh, we handle everything from, you know, the day-to-day -day issues that may arise to the difficult litigation, whether it's in federal court, state court, or with the DBPR in arbitration. And um, I lead up the firm's practice group in community associations, and I'm a, a partner here at the firm. And, uh, and so we'll be presenting today on uh, covenant uh, violations and the finding process. And uh, I'll turn it over to Fiona for, uh, to begin. All right, thanks so much. So I think we'll go to the next slide. And um, for those of you that have questions, um, as Max mentioned, you can um, you know, chat those in at the bottom. We did receive some questions in the, um, that were emailed to us. So I'll, I have those here and I'll make sure we get to those. But feel free to kind of, you know, chat in your questions as we're going. If I don't acknowledge your question right away, don't worry. Um, we definitely will do our best to get to all the questions. But I know that Hans has got a, um, a great presentation. So your question may be coming up in a future slide. So uh, bear with me if we don't get to it uh, immediately but we'll do our best to get to all the questions. Okay, so I think we can go to the next slide, Max, and then Hans will take us through. Okay, all right, well, thank you, Fiona. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin the presentation. So um, I wanna start off by uh, just giving a brief overview of why it's important to enforce the covenants. Um, and there's really two main reasons. The first is that as a, if you're a board member, you have a fiduciary duty to do so. Um, it's in the statute. I mean, that is really your main job as a board member is to enforce the covenants and restrictions that bind the properties and the owners. And if you're a licensed CAM, well, that's part of your duty uh, of, of being licensed is, is to enforce the covenants uh, and restrictions of the associations that you manage. So we do have that uh, statutory and licensing obligation in the first place. But beyond that, if you're not enforcing the covenants and restrictions, then you're gonna end up in a position where you could be waiving your right to enforce them going forward. So if you go down the, the slippery slope of letting some things slide here and there and you don't really address them, you could find yourself in a situation where you're losing control of the association and you may find yourself not able to enforce certain covenants if you've gone a long period of time without enforcing them. And so that's why it's important to always be able to show and demonstrate that as an association, you're actively uh, 
attempting to enforce the covenants as things arise. Now, obviously, things may always slip through the cracks. I mean, you may not know about a violation until it's brought to your attention. But the important thing is just to be able to demonstrate that you do have a history and active practice of uh, attempting to identify violations and addressing them according to the statutes and your governing documents. And as long as you're doing that, you'll be okay. You just don't want to fall into a situation where there's a prolonged period of time and it can be demonstrated that the association really hasn't done anything to enforce violations that are open and apparent because that's when you start falling into the territory of, well, maybe you've now waived your right to be able to enforce those. And so it is important, obviously, for property values, just to keep the neighborhood looking nice and just you know, to keep a, uh, a good environment between a healthy environment between the owners and obviously the board and the management. Um, you want to make sure everybody's playing by the rules or I, I guess I should say by the covenants and restrictions. Um, but so, you know, I thought it would be good to start off with just discussing the violation process in general, as far as identifying the violation and what you do from there, because really that's the first step in enforcing the covenants, right, is to identify a violation. And so they could be identified through a number of ways. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, you know, obviously the manager, um, it, you know, if, if the manager's on site, then the manager is there and any given day can identify a violation that may arise or, <clears throat> Um, there might be a set schedule time that, you know, for these large HOAs that uh, where the manager will travel through the association to identify violations, or um, maybe this could be delegated to a board member or to a committee member, depending on the association and all is fine. Any, you know, it doesn't really matter who's identifying the violations. And there's plenty of times um, where owners identify violations uh, that their neighbors are, are maybe doing because maybe it's causing some type of disturbance or nuisance or is doing something to detrimentally affect the association. So uh, uh, violations can also be identified by owners and they can report them to the board or to the manager and that's perfectly fine. And they so sure do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> from exactly. From time to time, right, Hans? Yeah, and yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure, you, you, you know, the managers that are in attendance today, your phones and emails are sometimes um, jumping off the hook because of uh, you're getting inundated by owners letting you know what's going on in the neighborhood, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, and, and I can add, too, we have a sort of a best practice uh, we like to follow. You hit with perfectly on all of the different sort of ways that violations, you know, can, can be reported. Uh, just for our board members out there, what we would suggest as the best practice is to, especially for the larger communities and even for the smaller ones, have it on a very set um, you know, schedule. So for your larger communities, we would divide the community up into quadrants. And you know, quadrant one is you know, these number of streets and the manager is doing the inspections you know, in week one, quadrant two is week two, and it just goes on a rotating basis. Um, that you want to keep it organized. Uh, organization is key when doing covenants enforcement. Organization and consistency, which Hans, you just mentioned, right? Um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so you don't want to have a bunch of different beholders. <laughs> you need to have some consistency with the people doing the inspections and what they're looking for um, specifically. And I, I found that that does make a difference because you also touched on, um, you know, just being good neighbors and keeping everybody in the community I don't want to say happy because that's a strong word. And when you're talking about covenants enforcement, but if people know what to expect when they're living in a community and they understand that, you know, the inspections are going to be done and they're going to be treated the same way that their neighbor is treated, that that goes a long, long way to keeping, you know, peace in a neighborhood. Yeah, that's right. And thank you, Fiona, for that, because that's great insight and context from the, from the management perspective, which I don't always get involved with uh, being the attorney. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, that's great. So, all right, once a, a violation is identified, um, obviously that's when the notice needs to go out to the owner. And uh, if, the, if there's a tenant, if, if the property is being rented, it needs to obviously go to the tenant as well. And, and you still need to CC the owner because the owner needs to know what's going on because it ultimately will fall on the owner's responsibility. So if it's a tenant committing a violation, you know, tenants are bound by the governing documents just as owners are. I mean, if they're living there and residing in the property, they're going to be bound by the governing documents because it, it controls that property, regardless of who's living in it. And so if it's a tenant doing the violation, well, you got to let the tenant know by sending them a written notice. But you also want to notify the owner as well, because ultimately 
the owner is going to be responsible for any fine. Now the owner and the tenant may have, you know, maybe in the lease that the tenant, uh, you know, that gets added to what's owed uh, under the lease agreement. That's between the owner and the tenant. But just the reason why I'm, why I'm explaining this is even if it's a tenant in the association, in the property, the association can still enforce its remedies against the owner and the tenant. And so if the tenant doesn't comply, then the association can enforce it against the owner. And then whatever happens between the owner and the tenant is between them based on their contractual relationship. But the way it works is you send a written notice to whoever it is, the tenant and the owner, or just the owner. Now, <clears throat> after doing this for a prolonged period of time, this is what I recommend that you contain in your violation notices. Now, some of this is going to be prescribed by the statute, but not all of it is. But this is what I believe should, at the very minimum, be contained within the violation notice. And that is, you need to describe what the violation is. I mean, you need to explain what's, what's going wrong, um, the date observed or the time period observed. And you need to cite to the specific covenant, rule of restriction, whether it's in a rules and regulations or an architectural guideline document or in the declaration itself, you need to specify and cite the actual covenant that's being violated. So it's, hey, here's what you did wrong. Here's the dates that it was done wrong. And oh, by the way, here's the covenant that you're violating. And then, um, you know, it's a 14 day notice if, when it comes to doing the statutory notice. You need to send a 14 day notice of the tenant or owner's opportunity uh, to have a hearing before the committee, which I'll get into in a later slide. Um, and the, the notice can either, the, the statute is worded a little ambiguously. It really just says you need to provide the owner uh, or the tenant with an opportunity for a hearing. Okay, so you could either, uh, I, some of the large associations, uh, you, you may have a committee hearing set each month or every or once a quarter. And so it's already scheduled because just you, if you're such a large community that you just, by definition, have several violations. And so you know, well, we might as well either have a monthly scheduled regular ongoing committee hearing or quarterly or however you want to do it. And if that's the case, then on the statutory violation notice, you can go ahead and set the time, date and place of the next upcoming committee hearing. And that's fine. Or because the statute's worded a little vaguely, um, you can at the very least just notify the owner and the tenant that they, hey, they have an opportunity to request a uh, hearing before the committee. Uh, because you might not be a large association, you could be a smaller association, so you don't have regularly scheduled committee hearings because you don't have that many violations. And so when, a, when one arises, you can let the owner or the tenant know, hey, you do have the right and the opportunity to request a hearing. Let us know if you want to request one. And then if they, if they do, then you can send them a subsequent uh, notice, informing, then informing them of the time, date, and place of the committee hearing. But at the very least, that's what needs to be on the, the statutory violation notice, along with inform. I mean, obviously, you got to inform them of what the penalty is, right? You got to inform them of the fine, which, according to the statute, whether it's the HOA Act or the Condo Act, it's a hundred dollars per day per violation, up to a maximum of a thousand dollars for continuing violations. Um, now, if you're an HOA, and I'll get into this a little later, but if you're an HOA, you you if your documents allow you to find more than a thousand dollars and you can do so. So at the very least that needs to be in your statutory violation notice. Now, with that being said, the association can send as many prior warnings as it desires. It's really up to the community. I mean, every community is a little different. Um, and that's fine as long as whatever process, whatever internal process and procedure you have in place for your community association, as long as you're following that consistently uh, and uniformly for all owners and you're not treating anybody differently, then that's fine. I mean, I represent associations where they send out, they'll send out just a warning, hey, uh, you know, you need to maintain your lawn, you got weeds and the flower beds, whatever, or hey, you need to repaint this part of your property, it's, it's becoming discolored. Uh, you can send warning notices, that's fine, and you can send as many as you want, but when it comes time to actually get serious about the violation to the point where you're going to fine or suspend somebody, you got to send the statutory violation notice, which is what I've described on this slide. That's when you've got to provide them with a 14 day notice uh, for an opportunity for the committee hearing. And you've got to inform them exactly of what the penalties may be. And you've got to provide the details of what the violation was and the covenant they're violating. 
Um, and so uh, I'll go ahead and we'll go over to the next slide now. And okay. And while you're doing that, Hans, if I can just mention again some of some of the real world sort of you know best practice. Um, sure. We do a lot for communities, especially if it's a community that maybe hasn't had a real regular covenants enforcement process prior to Castle coming on board. We like to start with an e-blast right to the community, kind of saying, you know, here are the five or the top 10 things, right? The, the fences that need to be pressure washed, you know, weeds in the flower beds, whatever it might be, crooked mailboxes, mold on the mailboxes, whatever it might be. There, every community normally has five to 10 sort of things that, you know, a lot of the residents could work on. And so we like to send a, a letter or an e-blast out to the residents, first of all, telling them this is what the board is doing in the community with the common areas. Here's the you know, the pressure washing we're doing of the sidewalks or cleaning the pool area, what, whatever it might may be. And then ask the residents, you know, to take five minutes this weekend, take this letter out, stand in front of your home, you know, look to see, do you have any of these things we're mentioning? Because we're doing, you know, a covenant sweep and uh, letters are going to be coming out, but we're not going to actually be sending the finding letters until you know, 30 days from now, we want to give everybody the opportunity, you know, to get ahead of this because we don't want to find anybody, you know, again, educating people that, uh, you know, sometimes people think, oh, the association's trying to make money. Oh, like, <laughs> we all know on this call that that's the last thing the association wants to do. If they never had to send, you know, a letter or hold a, uh, a finding committee meeting, they'd be happy, right? That the goal is not, this is not a revenue generator. Uh, what the board wants is for the association to have phenomenal curb appeal and can we work together as a community right to make that happen so taking that approach really helps so that when you get to this point where you actually are having to find people you can look them in the eye and say look we did everything we could not to find you we even gave like a you know a grace period and a list of potential areas of concern we asked you to you know do that we asked everybody to do that so we find that best practice really does help yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, and that is so true. And so not only, and I'll add to that, because not only is this some, this is not, I, I've never met any association that thinks that this is some type of, of great revenue generating <laughs> operation. But beyond that, really, and, it, and it's great that you do that because the point of what we're trying to do is just keep the neighborhood looking nice, right? That's all we're trying to do. We're not, you know, no one's, no, no, you know, no one's trying to punish a certain owner or a certain tenant, but if they're doing something they shouldn't do that's that's causing a blemish on the association and the property values, then obviously it's gotta be addressed. And so the purpose of this isn't to punish anybody, it's to keep all the properties within the neighborhood looking the way they're supposed to. And so that's great if, if you're sending out warnings or hey, here's a list of what you need to make sure you're either doing or not doing. And oh, by the way, this is when we do our inspections. And all that stuff is great because it helps avoid unnecessary drama in the association between the owners and the board members and the manager. That's not what you're trying to accomplish here. All you're trying to do is have the properties looking nice. And so the more you can explain to the owners what's going on or the more warnings you can provide them, as long as it's not detrimentally affecting the association, all that's great because it helps keep a cordial environment and you don't want everybody at each other's throats. Um, so I think that's a great practice, Fiona. And so let's talk a little more in detail about the fines and the suspensions, because that's really when it comes to covenant violations, that's your two, you know, that's your two sticks. You know, you got the carrot and the stick, and these are your two sticks, right? You can fine them and you can suspend their use rights to the common elements. And so for a fine, here's what the statutes say. And throughout the rest of this presentation, you're going to hear me talk about a little differences in the Condo Act and the HOA Act. I would say when it comes to covenant violations, it's about 90% the same. There's just a few distinctions between condos and HOAs. And I, I, you know, I don't know why you'd have to ask, ask your local legislature on that. I think they just like to keep us attorneys and managers on our toes. I don't know. But for some reason, there's little distinctions, whether you're a condo or an HOA, and I'll address that. Um, but regarding fines, as I mentioned, a fine is $100 per violation per day. Um, and that's and when it when it goes on for multiple days, it's called a continuing violation. So if there's a if you're an HOA and there's car, there's a car park on someone's front yard and it's just sitting there for five days, well that's a continuing violation, right? It's a, it's happening each day. 
And so you can find $100 per day for a continuing violation with a single 14-day notice and opportunity for a hearing, which is what we just discussed on the prior slide. Uh, and that is that hearing is before a committee of the owners. Um, and a fine cannot exceed $1,000 for condos. Now, if you're an HOA, it cannot exceed $1,000 either unless your documents say otherwise. And that's in the statute. So that's one of the differences between an HOA and a condo. So I represent an HOA that actually in its document says that fines can go up to $5,000. And the statute allows that for HOAs. It doesn't allow it for condos, but it allows it for HOAs. So if you have a continuing violation in that, in that example, if you have a continuing violation, you can find $100 per day up to 50 days if it lasts that long. And that's the $5,000. Um, now, but Hans, can, can you, sorry, because we always get questions on this, so yeah. um, can you just elaborate a little bit on that one? Because the question I always get from boards is, well, do I have to send a letter every day, or can I just send the one letter that says you're in violation and it'll be $100 per day as long as, you know, the, the car sits on the lawn? Yeah, that's, that's right. And so you do not have to send a violation notice each day. So that, in that example I gave you, you do not have to send a separate notice for 50 days straight. Um, what you have to do is you just have to, you have to explain to the owner what's coming if they don't comply. Um, so you gotta make it clear to them. So you can send the one notice that says, hey, you've got a car parked on your grass. It's been there since so-and-so date. The law and the documents say that we can find you $100 per day up, up to $5,000 in the example I gave about my HOA or $1,000 if you're if going by just a statute. You need to let them know that. And as long as you let them know that, then you don't have to keep sending a notice each day. Because actually, this language right here where it says a single 14-day notice, that's what the statute says. The, actual, the statute actually, all you have to do as an association, whether you're a condo or an HOA, all you have to do to comply is send one single notice giving them 14 days to cure the violation or to have the opportunity for a committee hearing. That's all you have to do. Now, what Fiona just described is that, you know, her managers will send, uh, you know, multiple warnings or, hey, a list of, hey, this is what we're looking for. These are the day we do the inspections and all that is great, right? That's great for keeping a friendly, cordial relationship between the owners. But the statute doesn't require that. All the statute, I mean, to comply with the statute, you just send a one 14-day notice, which could cause problems if you're just sending one notice. Oh, hey, this is what you did. We're going to start finding you. If we don't hear from you in 14 days, here's your fine. Um, statute, you know, that's what the statute says. But for just, you know, human relation purposes, you might want to have some warning notices or, or something beyond just that. But Here's another distinction in the law between condos and HOAs. For a condo, a fine can never become a lien. It, it just can't. It actually says that. It says a fine cannot become a lien. In the HOA Act, it says fines of less than $1,000 may not become a lien. And so what does that imply? That implies that if your fine in an HOA is $1,000 or more, then that could become a lien against an HOA parcel. Why is there that distinction? I don't know, but there is. So just remember that and this is important because let's say you have an owner that is past due in assessments and has a fine and you're in the condo. Well, if, if, if we're not paying attention between the board, the manager, and the attorney, if we're not paying attention, let's say that they owe $1,000 in past due assessments and a $1,000 fine. Well, the statute says if you're a condo, a fine cannot become a lien. So if you send the notice of intent to lien, they don't respond, it comes time to do the lien, you got to make sure that that fine isn't on the lien. You could fine them for the past due assessment, but the statute says that a fine cannot become a lien in a condo. Or if you're an HOA and the fine is only $500, you can't lien for that either. You only can if you're $1,000 or more. So just make sure that when it comes time to do a lien, you're not including the fine on the lien. Now you can include everything else on the lien, the past due assessments and interest and all that, but just not the fine. Um, now, if an owner doesn't pay the fine, and I'll get into this a little more detail later, if the owner doesn't pay the fine, you can sue them in small claims court for a money judgment, and the statute says that that's a prevailing party fee action, which means that when the association prevails in collecting the fine, you can also collect your attorney's fees for, uh, for that action. Now that's fines. Now you can also do a suspension of use rights to the amenities, and so this is in the statute as well. 
It says that an association may suspend for a reasonable period of time the right of a member or the tenant to use the common area amenities um, for violations. So if you have a clubhouse or a pool or a gym or tennis courts, you can suspend their rights to do that for a reasonable time. So, um, and we, you know, we'll talk a little more about what that may be or what that may look like. Um, but just know that you also have the right to do that. You can do both. It's not one or the other. You can do both. You can fine and suspend their use rights until, you know, because of the, because of the covenant violation. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about the statutory process because that does involve a committee. So let me let me preface this by saying that the Florida legislature has set up associations, community associations, to be self-governed. And what that means is you have a board. Uh, you know, you do your own policing, your own enforcing, uh, if you will. Um, so you have a board. You have, obviously have a, a manager, um, and then you have committees. And they're all made, you know, they're made up of owners. Obviously, the manager is not, but the board is are owners, the committees are owners. And so the Florida legislature has set up associations to be self-governing, especially when it comes to covenant enforcement. And so it's really supposed to be handled internally between the board and the committee. And this, you know, one reason for this is just to allevi alleviate the court system. I mean, if you, you there's thousands of associations throughout the state of Florida. So if you can imagine that if this wasn't in the statute and your only remedy was to go to the court and keep someone from violating the, the covenant, you can imagine how how much more you stress that would be on the court system and how much more delayed everything would be if every covenant violation issue had to go through the court. And so the Florida legislature has set this up so that you're self-governing. Now, there may be instances where you need to go to court if the fine and suspension doesn't work and you need to get an injunction. Or you, or the guy's not, the person's not paying the fine, and you got to sue them. So there may be times where you're supposed to, where you have to go to court. But it's set up so that you know a, a large force, portion of your covenant violations can be resolved internally. But to fine or to suspend, you have to have this committee. Now the the statute doesn't call it anything; it just calls it a committee of owners. Um, so you can call it whatever you want. I mean, uh, associations call it the appeals committee sometimes because they look at it as well. You're appealing. The, 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 the violation notice, or it's, it could be called the Covenant Enforcement Committee or the Finding Committee. I mean, it's called all types of things. The statute doesn't call it anything except for the committee. But here's what the statute says. And this is straight from the statute. It says a fine or suspension may not be imposed by the board. So it's the board that does the imposed. It may not be impo imposed by the board without at least 14 days notice um, to the person that you're, you're, that's doing the violation, the tenant or the owner or both, um, and giving them an opportunity for a hearing before this committee that has to be at least three members. So they have to be members of the association, three members. They're appointed by the board. So this will be appointed at a board meeting and, and maintained in the minutes. Um, but those three board members or those three committee members cannot be officers, directors, or employees of the association, or the relative of an officer, director, or employee of the association. So if you're on the board, your spouse cannot be on the committee or any other relative cannot be, the committee is supposed to be independent. And here's what the statute, and it's supposed to be independent of the board. You know, it's supposed to be completely independent. So this is what the statute says. The committee's only role, the committee has one role, that role is limited to determining whether to confirm or reject the fine or suspension. That's it. That's the committee's only role. Um, the committee doesn't make the rules. The board makes the rules. Um, the committee doesn't do anything else. Their role, this is right. It's, there's quotations because this is what the statute says. This committee, its only role is you either vote to approve or reject the covenant violation, the fine and suspension. Um, so that's, um, that's a big one, Hans, from a from a real world. I, I see it. Um, that question comes up with the committee. We typically call it the covenant committee, not a understanding or appreciating that specific specificity <laughs> in the statute. Right. So Mr. Smith comes in and says, you know, hey, I have this hundred dollar fine and, you know, he's got whatever, you know, terribly sad, legitimate story. And the committee says, well, instead of $100, we'll charge 50. And, and we're always saying, no, 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 you guys, you can't, you, can, you don't have that authority. You can either say, okay, 
Mr. Smith, you know, we understand and we are going to, you know, say no, no fine is going to be, you know, placed here. Yeah. We'll give you forgiveness or forbearance or we're sorry, we don't have a choice. You know, it, it's one or the other. It's not something in between. And it's very, very, very clear. And, and that's, I like to say, relatively new, right? Within the last, I can't remember when that came into play. Was it five years ago or something? Yeah, um, give or take. Yeah. So it's a definitely one I want to make sure everybody on the on the call uh, recognizes because it, it it surprises me how often that question still comes up. Um, and then we have a question that came in. I think it's a good time to to maybe clarify. It says, "Does the fine begin on the first day the fourteen notice the fourteen day notice is sent, or at the end of the fourteen days?" And does the board first need to hold a meeting to impose the fine against the order, against the owner? That is a great, great question because the statute is very ambiguous. Um, the statute pretty much says exactly what's on this screen. Um, so it doesn't say, I mean, the statute, what you would love as an attorney, I can tell you what I would love is, is I love detailed, clear statutes, and you don't always get that. And this is one that, that, that you don't, that it's not, because I would love for this statute to say, the fine cannot commence until the 14th day or the 15th day, but it doesn't say that. Um, so what, what the statute says is you got to give a 14 day notice of someone's opportunity uh, to go before the committee to, to basically plead their case and to, and to maybe give a reason why they shouldn't be held responsible. So, it, it, so if you take, if you put all this together, I mean, you could interpret it to say that, well, hey, once a violation is identified, I mean, a violation is a violation and the fine starts right then. I mean, the, 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 the statute says you could be fined hundred dollars per day per violation. You just got to give them a 14 day notice to challenge it. So if you notice a violation on July 1st, and the letter goes out on July 1st and says, hey, we noticed you got a car parked in the grass. We're gonna start finding you $100 per day. I mean, look, the violation happened then. I mean, that's the violation and you're finding someone for the violation. Now they have 14 days to get back to you and, and say, yes, I want a hearing or, or if you already have a pre-scheduled committee hearing, they, you can inform them of that and they can show up to that. Um, and then if the committee says, okay, we're not going to fine you, then you don't, then the board can't fine you. If for whatever reason the committee says that. If the committee says, yes, we're going to, we, we actually agree with the board and this should be a fine, well, then you can oppose the fine. Um, I mean, it's, it's $100 a day up to $1,000. And so in my opinion, and I, I only say this by opinion because the statute is not clear on this. So I can't say this is what the legislature says. But I can tell you what the statute says. The statute says that you could find someone for a covenant violation. You just got to give them a 14-day notice. So if they yeah. ignore the 14-day notice or if they don't show up to the hearing or they never request a hearing, well, they've already committed the violation. And so you can find them. I mean, if their violation lasted for a whole month, well, if you're a condo, you can do $100 per day up to 10 days and you can find $1,000. So if that committee hearing comes and goes and they don't show up or they don't request to attend, well, then you can find them. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is one I think each association, depending on the, um, depending on the really the flavor of the association, and by that I mean, you know, some of our associations, they've had you know covenant committees, you know, in place for years. It's very, you know, it runs like clockwork, and it would be a very rare occasion where a a a, um, a fine would be waived by the committee, like you know, once a year, if that, in some of my communities. Other communities, they have the, you know, they do a great job. They, they have very active um, finding committee. They do the meetings, but they're quite, like they really want to work with the residents because they're relatively new in this process. And so that committee is waiving a lot of fees as long as it's not a second time offender for the same thing and, you know, that, that type of thing. So the reason I tell you all of that is it kind of depends, even from a management standpoint, what we would recommend, because you don't want your manager applying all of these fines um, onto the ledger and then the committee waiving them all and then the manager having to go back and take them all off the ledger. That makes no sense, right? So you have to really sit with management and, and in your attorney and talk through your specific association's examples 
and come up with a best practice. And then again, consistency is what we always recommend from a castle standpoint, you know, put it in writing, put the policy together. This is what's going to happen. Um, so hopefully we answered that person's question. I, it's not a, a straight line in the sand, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. And, and um, you know, just to piggyback on what you just said, Fiona, you know, these committees got to be very careful about waiving fines because you're setting precedent. So you can't waive a fine just because you like the person. Oh, this person yeah. is your neighbor and she's a school teacher. And she's so great and nice. Yeah. The, the fine, the, the statute doesn't say that you can either levy or waive fines based on the person, the guy's personality or how much you like them. It's right. you either waive or levy a fine on whether there was a violation or not. And so you got to be very careful. I mean, if, if a person committed a violation, um, you know, the committee really shouldn't waive it. How about this? Let me give you, let, let me, let me give you an example. And it, it's an absurd example, but I always give it to try to prove the point. And then let me maybe give a little context as to why it's set up like this and what we're trying to accomplish. So here's the example. Let's say there's a car parked on the, on the yard, on the front yard. It's an HOA. There's a car parked on the front yard. Obviously you can either park in the driveway or the garage. You can't park on the front yard. So that's a violation. Um, and I've used this example before, obviously, throughout this, I mentioned this, but, but here, here we go. So you send the notice and you say, hey, you have your right for an opportunity for a hearing. Uh, if you don't move, you know, we're, we're going to fine you $100 a day because your car's parked on the grass. You can't park on the grass. Well, let's say that this person shows up to the hearing and says, hey, you know what? That was not my car. I don't know whose it was. I woke up in the morning. The car was just there. Maybe it was someone who left the bar and was drinking and they just left the car there and walked home. Who knows? It's an absurd example, right? But that's the point. And then the committee says, oh, okay, we didn't know that. We thought it was your car. Now that we know it wasn't your car and it's not your fault, we will waive the fine. And then, but the committee has to be clear. I mean, the committee needs to explain to the board, hey, it wasn't their car. They don't know whose it was. So it, right. the car just showed up in their yard. Now it's an absurd example, but I'm just giving you an it's example. It's a great example. Yeah. yeah. I'm giving yeah. you an example as to why a committee may waive the fine. That's an acceptable reason. You can't just wave a fine because you like the person or because the person was an ex-board member or was on the committee last year. Um, now, let me kind of explain this process to you because, you know, we talk about this and I think as an attorney, you know, I'm involved in this all day long and Fiona, you are too and all the managers. So I think sometimes we might overlook the fact that for new board members or even tenured board members, this whole thing might be a little confusing. I'm like, why are we doing this? What is this? Okay. As I mentioned, the Florida legislature has set you all up as community association to be self-governing, right? Okay, but we're still under the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution, which requires due process. Due process is you, you've got to get your, your, you know, before rights can be impaired, people have to be provided with notice and an opportunity for a hearing, right? That's due process. If you think back to whatever class you might have taken, whenever, that's due process. you got to have notice and a right to a hearing. And that's what this is. So um, you're set up to be self-governing, but you still got to respect people's rights, right? Um, so that's what this is set up to do. You, you give a notice and an opportunity for a hearing. And so look at it this way. You get a speeding ticket. Who's giving you the speeding ticket? It's the police officer. The police officer notices the violation. The violation is you speeding. He writes you a ticket. But what do you have the opportunity to do? You have the opportunity to go to the courthouse, talk to the judge, and try to get a, and try to explain a justification. Maybe you know you're taking your pregnant wife to the hospital or whatever. Okay, well that's what we have going on here. Look at it this way: the board is like the police, right? The board identifies the violation and sends you a violation notice, which is kind of the equivalent of a ticket, right? Hey, you're going to be fine. Well, this committee is set up to be, I guess, the judiciary, you could say, right? It, it, it's it's checks and balances. So if the owner is to prevent a board from being a little too aggressive or maybe, you know, overpowering. It's the whole due process notice and hearing. So the owner has the right to have a hearing before a committee of his peers and to plead his case or her case as to why they shouldn't be fine. Now, if it's a violation and there's really no good excuse, then the committee shouldn't be waiving it. The committee votes by majority vote. So it'd be two out of three. If you vote to approve the fine, then it's imposed. If you vote to not approve the fine, then it's not imposed. But that's what we got going on here. It's the whole due process. It's the whole notice and hearing. It's just your self-governing. So the board is the enforcer and the committee is like the judiciary. So that's kind of what we got going on here. That helps to explain this. Um, yeah. I, I think that does, Hans. We had a few questions come in, but I'm gonna hold them because I know we've got a few more slides to get through. 
and yep. we're at about 1240. So we'll go through the slides and then just so the uh, board members know, I'll definitely we'll get we'll have time for questions here yep. shortly. Yep, thank you, Tiana. And I'll get through these quickly. So you can also do a suspension um for something that's not a covenant violation and so if, if if this is in the statute so if you're more than 90 days delinquent and paying an obligation to the association whether it's an assessment a special assessment whatever well then then that person can be suspended you can suspend their use rights to the common element simply because they're more than 90 days past due you don't you don't need a notice and a hearing for that because this isn't a covenant violation this is just hey you haven't paid for 90 days and so the statute says that you can Go ahead and suspend their use rights until they pay. Now, here's what I would recommend: the suspension has to be done at a member at a meeting, right? It has to be done at a board meeting, but don't announce the members' names and you know, or property addresses because that's actually you can't you can't publicly announce debts. That's a violation of federal and Florida debt collection law. So what you would do is you would say, well, we have 15 properties that are more than 90 days past due, and per this statute, we're going to motion and second and vote on suspending those owners' uh, use rights. The manager knows who they are. The board members know who they are. You don't have to announce it. And then you vote, and then they're suspended until they pay. Now, this next, now this next slide says that you can also suspend uh, their rights, uh, voting rights, for being past due. Now, this is another area where there's a difference. So for HOAs, um, if you're 90 days past due, you can suspend their use rights to the amenities and their voting rights. If you're a condo, you have to be 90 days past due and it has to be more than a thousand dollars to suspend voting rights. So it gets kind of confusing and convoluted. So if you're a condo and someone's 90 days delinquent, you can suspend their use rights because the prior slide said you could do so. Now, can you suspend their voting rights? Maybe it just depends if, they're, if what's owed is more than a thousand dollars. And the same thing applies here. You can suspend their voting rights for this unpaid debt of more than 90 days, and you don't need a notice in a hearing for this because it's prescribed per statute. Now, um, the suspension goes until they pay. So as soon as the person pays, their suspension ends and their voting rights are, are, um, are reinstated. Okay, now um, this just kind of summarizes this. I don't really need to go into this in too much detail because we've already addressed this, but this, this slide just kind of summarizes your options to collect fines. Uh, for violation. And so obviously you put it on their statement and you can collect it. And if they don't pay, you can sue them for a money judgment and you'll be, you'll have your right to claim attorney's fees. Um, if you're an HOA and it's more than a thousand dollars, well, then it can actually become part of the lien and then you could use that as part of a uh, foreclosure action if you're so inclined to do so. Um, the, um, uh, well, I lost my train of thought here, but, um, but this is why this, oh, oh, here's what I was gonna say. It's a, it's a prevailing party cause of action. If you sue someone because they were levied a fine and they never paid, you could sue them. But this is why the associations need to make sure you're following the statutory process. And that's because if you happen to lose, if the judge says, hey, I know you find them, but you actually never gave them an opportunity for a hearing, or you never, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, or you forgot to mail the notice, whatever. Well, then if the owner wins, they get to collect their attorney's fees from the association. So it works both ways. So this is why you got to make sure you're following the process. Work with your manager, work with your attorney, make sure that if you're finding someone, you're following the proper process. Now, let me address this. If you do not have a finding committee or whatever you want to call this committee, you cannot find and you cannot suspend. And unless it's for past due amounts of more than 90 days that we discussed on the prior slide. If it's for a covenant violation, you can't do a fine and you can't do a suspension of use rights because it takes a committee to do that. Now, I know some associations, it's hard enough to get owners to volunteer for the board, much less a committee. So it might not be any fault of yours. It's just, unfortunately, if you don't have this committee, you can't find to spend. Now, it doesn't mean you can't send a violation notice. So let me give you your options. Let's say you're an association and you don't have a, a committee. Well, you could still send a violation notice. You could still threaten it. You just can't do it. So you could send a violation notice saying, hey, you committed this violation oh, by the way, the statute says we can fine you and we can suspend your use rights. And all that's true. The statute does say that. You just can't do it unless you have the committee. So you can still send your violation notice and, you know, you're, you're going to get people to comply just by doing that. So you can still Agreed. threaten it, you just can't do it. But um, other than that, you can sue them for an injunction. So let's say someone does something that warrants a fine. Let's say they painted their house green, right? That's always the, you know, we always get the crazy example. Hey, they painted their house pink or green. Well, 
uh, if you don't have a committee and you can't find them, suspend them, then you probably need to sue them for an injunction. You can still do that. So you still have remedies. You still have options. It's just the easiest and quickest is the fine and the suspension, but you need a committee to do that. And was right. there a minimum number on the committee, Hans? Did, did uh, we cover that? Yeah, it has to be at least three. Three, okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, now this slide just talks about HOA dispute resolution because while we're on the topic of covenant violations, um, the HOA Act and the Condo Act provides um, specific venue and jurisdiction over certain claims. And so it's different for both HOAs and for condos. And so here's what the HOA Act says. Um, the DDPR is the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. That's an agency of the executive branch of the Florida government. Um, they're in charge of licensing for CAMs and for contractors and whoever else. And they also have jurisdiction over certain HOA and condo disputes. So disputes that are eligible for uh, arbitration through the DDPR are the recall of board members and election disputes. Disputes that require pre-suit mediation. So these are disputes that you have to go to court but before you go to court, you have a pre-suit mediation process that you must follow. And these are the five or six reasons listed here on this slide right here that, um, that are subject to this pre-suit mediation requirement before you can sue someone. And so you'll see it is use of or changes to a person. So in the situation I just gave you, if someone paints their house green and you don't have a finding committee, you can sue them, but you first have to do this pre-suit mediation. And so you have to send out the pre-suit mediation notice and mediate it and try to get it resolved. And if it doesn't, if there's an impasse, then you can sue them to get an injunction. Now, here's what the statute says. If you fail to do the pre-suit mediation process for these five or six items listed here that require it, then you're waiving, you're foregoing your ability to claim prevailing party attorney's fees. So if you sue them and win, great, you can get your injunction to win. But if you didn't do the pre-suit mediation process, you're not gonna be able to recover your attorney's fees. That's the statutory penalty for not following the pre-suit mediation process. Now, this is for HOAs. For condos, there's certain disputes that are jurisdiction is the DDPR and certain disputes that the jurisdiction is the state court. And so up at the, at the top of this slide, you'll see the five or six um, types of disputes that are eligible for DDPR arbitration. Um, and you know it's recall disputes, election disputes, but it's also... Um, unit use disputes or common element use disputes or failure to conduct uh, uh, meetings properly or things like that. Um, now, these down here, these five or six down here are disputes that are not eligible for arbitration through the DDPR, but require a state court action. And that's title issues, collection of fines and fees and assessments, evictions, um, uh, claims of damage for failure to maintain common elements, those type of things must go through state court. Now, here's another distinction. The HOA Act, as we just discussed, has a pre-suit mediation mandatory requirement for certain disputes. For the condo, you can do pre-suit mediation if you want. It's, uh, it, the statute says it's available to you, but it's not mandatory, so you don't have to do it. So it's there, you just don't have to do it like you have to do it at HOAs for certain disputes. Why the legislature does this to us, I don't know, but there's all these weird, unique distinctions that we yeah. gotta make sure we're following. So for disputes, that's why I, I strongly encourage you board members, talk to your manager, talk to your attorney, make sure you figure out what category your dispute falls in and make sure you're following the right process so you don't find yourself either in the wrong area, getting your case dismissed or losing your ability to claim prevailing party attorney's fees. So just rest assured that if you don't have a committee in place, you can still enforce your covenants. It's just not as easy and it requires getting your attorney involved and doing some of these uh, litigation actions, but you can still do it. Yeah, and I think for, I know um, people are hesitant, right? As you said, even to get on a board, let alone to be on the covenants committee where they're making decisions about finding people. But um, we find once we start sending letters and the community sees that you know it's done in a professional manner and the letters are going out on a consistent basis, you'll start to get some buy-in. And also people don't realize being on the committee, the good thing is, right, that they're they're saying yay or nay. They're not having to really, you know, go in the gray. They can't operate in the gray. We've already covered that. So that makes it a little bit easier too. So I would encourage the boards to 
you know, uh, sometimes it's education. If you can educate the potential committee members on, you know, what their truly their duties are. Um, this one is actually a pretty cut and dry committee and normally those meetings go very quickly. So. Yep. Yeah, and this is the last slide and we'll save some minutes for um, Q and A, but let me just share with you some best practices that I've learned over the years. Um, sometimes the developer doesn't record your architectural guidelines and standards or sometimes you're, you create them after turnover, just make sure they're recorded. You, you make sure you record those. That way, if you get involved in some kind of lawsuit, you know, the fact that they're not recorded doesn't become an issue. So just make sure that those are recorded. Here's a best practice. If you remember nothing else, remember this. When you identify violations, take a date time stamp picture of the violation and keep it in the owner's files because you don't want to get caught up in a he said, she said, you know, um, you know, you send a violation notice, they dispute it, they go to the committee hearing, hearing they dispute it, um, they claim they didn't do the violation, the committee still fines them, they refuse to pay it, now you got to sue them, they show up to court and say, I didn't do it. You could avoid that whole song and dance just by having daytime stamp pictures of the violations and keeping it in the file. Now, here's another best practice, just to keep finding commi these committee hearings from getting out of control or adversarial. The, the committee hearing is for the owner to have an opportunity to plead his case, right? So let the owner do that. The owner can come and plead his case. Here's what I recommend. When it comes time for the committee to vote on whether to levy the fine or suspension or not, excuse the owner, okay? You don't have to sit there in that awkward moment and have the owner sitting right there while you guys convene and then announce the vote in front of them because that, I mean, the owner might get mad. It might elevate to a situation you don't want it to elevate to. Nothing in the statute says you have to vote in front of the person. It just says you got to give the person an opportunity to have this hearing so he can come and state his case. And once he does so, you can say, thank you, Mr. Jones. We will take that under advisement. Uh, you're excused. The committee will discuss what you said and we'll hold a vote and we'll inform you. Excuse the person. Then the committee can vote on whether to uphold the fine or not. And then if it does, it can inform the board and then the board will send a letter to the owner saying, yes, you were fine. The statute doesn't say you, you can't do that. So I would recommend doing that to avoid any, you know, any elevation of tension in the hearing that might cause issues. Um, here's another best practice. And look, this isn't in the statute. This is just something that, you know, this is just coming from me. You got to send a letter to the, if a fine is levied or suspension is levied or both, you got to send a letter to the owner informing them of that. Here's what I recommend. The letter should specify the dates of the noted violation. Um, it should be from the date of the initial violation notice or warning letter to the committee hearing. So, for example, uh, the committee met on November 10th to discuss the violation of you parking your car in the grass. The committee voted to impose the fine. The fine is $1,000. It's due within the five in, within five days. And this fine and suspension is for the violation occurring between October 1st and November 10th. And then let them know if, if you don't cure your violation, or if the same violation happens again, then the covenant enforcement process will start over again. Now that's not in the statute, <clears throat> but the statute doesn't say you can't do it, right? So if the statute doesn't say you can't do it, then I presume you can, you've got to put people on notice. So <clears throat> this is the situation where someone commits a violation, they pay the fine, and then they, they just keep, they, they just say, no, I pay, I, I can, I'm can. i gonna live here for 40 years and I'm gonna do this violation for 40 years because I paid my $1,000. No, I don't believe that's the intent of the legislature. Okay, but if you're going to find someone again, you gotta you gotta let people know. I mean, you can't just you can't just assume people are going to know. So you gotta tell them. So that's what I recommend on this letter. Tell people this fine is for these dates. We identified it here. The committee hearing is here. You're being fined for this. If you keep doing this, you're going to be fined again. And that way, if he wants to challenge it, you can say no. We put you on notice. We told you you can't do this again, or you'll be fined. Again. So that's what I recommend. So thank you, Fiona. I may have gone a little over for our Q&A and I apologize, but I'll be here to answer any questions. No, no, you're good. You're good. Thank you. We have a couple of questions uh, that came in. So um, the first one um, is from Julie. She says, can the fine be waived if the person claims financial hardship? I think you touched on this a little bit, but uh, anything to, to add to that? I think the whole financial hardship, right, uh, comes up a lot. Well, this is, gosh, you know, this is, this is the, this is where the trying to be a decent, good person to your neighbors versus your obligations this is where they meet, right? 
that's not all, all it's not always a, a nice meeting, right? I mean, because uh, look, you want to help people out, but you can't, you gotta be you gotta be careful. You can't just start making exceptions here and there willy-nilly because now you're gonna have selective enforcement defenses, you're gonna have waiver defenses. Hey, you did this to this person and not me. That's not fair. You don't want to be in that situation. I would say, look, can you do it? Yes. Um what should you do if you want to do it? You should set up an internal policy so it's crystal clear. If someone wants to claim a financial hardship, they need to produce evidence of this. Like, if some, some, did you lose your job? Provide the termination letter. Are you unemployed? Provide some proof. And then the board will work with a payment plan. Okay? I wouldn't say waive it. Work with a payment plan. But if you don't have it in writing and you're just willy-nilly doing stuff, you're going to open yourself up for a can of worms that you don't want to go down because you're going to start treating people differently. And then the other person is going to say, well, this guy didn't pay you for six months, so I'm not going to pay you for six months. And it's like, well, no, that guy had a reason. Oh, yeah, what was his reason? Show me where that's written. So you got to, like, so look, I'm not telling you not to be a good neighbor. What I'm telling you to do is if you want to be a good neighbor and give people a break, you got to have a policy. You got to have something you're working off of, some board resolution, something in writing that you can point to and say, no, this is the process. If you can prove a financial hardship, then maybe we'll give you a three month payment plan. Okay. But you got to be consistent with everybody. Now, I'm not saying you have to do that. You don't have to do that. But if, if you want to do that, make sure you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Yeah. And that kind of speaks to the right giving the, um, again, the committee, don't put the committee in a bad position, right? As a board, make sure they have some guidelines so they're, they're not having to make willy nilly decisions, right? It's, again, cut and dry very much it, it is or it isn't they're like it, it, don't give them the wiggle room because as soon as you do that you put them in a compromising position right, essentially right, right. okay next question says if the owner does not request a hearing does the finding committee still need to meet to approve the fine am i well so here well um you know it's the legislature doesn't make it easy on us attorneys because it doesn't talk to these, right? So I mean, you can talk to five attorneys and get five different answers because the statute doesn't say. Here's what the statute says. The statute says you got to give 14 days notice and an opportunity for a hearing. It doesn't say you must have a hearing. You got to give an opportunity for a hearing. What does that mean? Opportunity for a hearing isn't defined in the statute. So this is why I say you might ask five attorneys and get five different answers. In my opinion, an opportunity is just that, an opportunity. You got to tell the person, hey, you have an opportunity. Now, like I said, if you're one of these big associations that you just have so many violations, you're in the habit of having one scheduled every month or quarter, then you might as well go ahead and just tell them, here's the date of the next committee hearing. Because what you don't want to do, if you're an association that has set committee hearings for this because you have, you're so big and you have so many violations, well, you don't want to not tell them and then have the person say, well, you already had a hearing scheduled. You couldn't have told me. So if, you, if you're an association that has hearings scheduled, I would say go ahead and include that on the notice. You have an opportunity for a hearing. And oh, by the way, the association's next hearing is December 1st. But if you're an association that doesn't have regularly scheduled committee hearings on this, then all the statute says you got to give them an, an opportunity. So in my opinion, that means that you just inform them, hey, you had the opportunity for a hearing. You need to request one. If you want a hearing, Contact the attorney, contact the manager within 14 days and let us know. And then, in my opinion, you comply with the statute because that's all it says is you just got to give an opportunity. Yeah, and I've seen letters um, and I would recommend, of course, get this blessed by your association council. But I've seen letters that basically say what you just said, Hans. And then at the, at the very last sentence, it says, if, if we do, you know, don't hear from you, if you don't contact us, you know, the, the the meeting is considered had and, and your fine, you know, stays basically yeah. something along. That's not exactly the verbiage, but they put yeah. something in there that kind of basically says, if you don't make the request, this is happening. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So check with check with your uh, association attorney. And then the last question is very specific. So I'm going to read it. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to, to help this gentleman or not. He says, our attorney recommends that we that we not fine, but just go straight to a letter from the attorney. They suggest that if a fine is paid, then that payment represents a remedy of the violation and no other action can be taken for that violation, even if the violation is never corrected. Is this accurate? I think, I think what he's saying is uh, similar to what you were saying about not assuming that just because you left your garbage cans out and you got fined once and you paid $1,000 that you can never get fined again. I, maybe that's it's very specific. 
Gosh, that's hard for me to comment on because there's just so much that I don't know. I mean, do you, right. is the attorney saying this because you don't have a fining committee? And, he, and like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a letter saying pay this fine. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I would love to be able to help, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to step on that attorney's toes because I don't know what's going on there. Um, so I don't know. I wish I could help you more, but that's just something. It's just there's too much unknown for me to tell you if something's being handled right or not. Yeah. No. Fair. Yeah. That those that real specific ones are get get tricky, and I appreciate that. Well, listen, we it's 101. Look at that. We ended up ending right on time. So Hans, thank you so, so much for your uh, for your time that you spent with us today. We all really appreciate it. Always a wealth of knowledge and, and great to see you. Um, and for our board members who joined, thank you very much. Um, you can see on the screen, you can reach out to Hans uh, directly. You can send us um, an email at info at castlegroup.com. And uh, Hans, I'm sure we'll do this again. Any last parting words from your end? No, hey, I enjoy this. Um, I enjoy helping uh, volunteer board members. It's a thankless job. Uh, if you're if you're making 100 everybody happy, you're probably doing something wrong because if you're doing your job right, not everybody's happy. So I enjoy the, I enjoy helping you volunteer board members out, and obviously the managers as well. And I just want to say thank you to you, Fiona, and the Castle Group for having me. And I'm always available next time you want me. All right, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. All right, thank you. Bye.